Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Brad Trimble. I'm the Director of Learning and Development for the Research and Planning Group for California Community Colleges. Um, I'm joined today by a team from Orange Coast College um, who's here to talk about some um, innovative work they've been doing um, related to predictive analytics. So um, before we kick off here, just wanted to go over a little bit of housekeeping. Um, our presenters have a lot of content to cover. So they've requested that um, questions are held until the conclusion of the presentation today. Um, so uh, let's help them out with that and be sure to table those questions until we get to a point where we can address them. And with that, we'll, let's go ahead here and kick off uh, predictive modeling to improve student outcomes. And I'll turn it over to the Orange Coast team. Welcome. Hi, uh, thank you, Brad. Um, we're happy to be here. My name is Sherry Sterner. I'm the Dean of uh, Research Planning and Institutional Effectiveness at Orange Coast. And uh, we have uh, Daisy Sokovia and Gina Marie Perio uh, with us who uh, played an integral role as our analysts on the team. And so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Daisy and Gina Marie to introduce themselves before we get started. Hello everyone, I'm Daisy Segovia. I'm the Senior Research Analyst at Orange Coast College. And I'm Daisy Perio, and I am the Student Success and Equity Specialist Senior, but I've also been playing a role as a data analyst on this team. Great, and thank you for joining us today. And hopefully you can see my screen here. You see uh, my hopefully beautiful blue PowerPoint here. Um, and today we're gonna be talking about predict how we use predictive modeling to improve student success. Uh, uh, student outcomes. Um, so um, what we're going to be going over today um, is how we engage different groups in this project. So how we engage cross-functional teams in a collaborative David Dimon approach. We'll go over what we did with our predictive modeling and how we use historical data to identify outliers and validate predictive models. And then we'll go over the specifics of those models and what factors came out of them on student onboarding, success, persistence, and completion. So throughout this presentation, you'll also notice that we'll have little things pop up where we'll comment on lessons learned that we had, that we learned throughout this, pro throughout this process. So hopefully if this is something that you guys wanna take out of your institution, you'll learn from what we learned and you'll be able to do a better project in the end. So what is it that we did? So when we went into this, into this project, we really wanted to focus on using a data-driven approach to help further the college's mission of empowering students to achieve their educational goals. So research has shown that student data can be a very powerful resources for understanding patterns of student progression and their achievement over time. So to this end, we set out to do a three-phase project um, using student level data to address um, and identify different areas needed improvement along the college's enrollment pipeline. So this enrollment pipeline encompasses when the student begins with us at application and then moving to, uh, into when they're actually at the institution when they're taking courses. And then finally through uh, continuing through their completion of their educational goal. So with this project using data, we hope that we can understand the patterns of our students' progression because it may not be um, the same for every one of our students. And we also want to maybe highlight, uh, uh, illuminate barriers in, within this progression that is stopping them from meeting their goals. Um, and hopefully also highlight successful practices that are helping them meet their goals. And overall, it just adds to an ultimate goal of helping students to empowering them to achieve their students' outcomes um, and pinpointing and closing um, uh, any kind of gaps that we may be seeing in our, in our blind. So how we plan to do that is using three phases of this plan. The first one being a quantitative, uh, using quantitative predictive models, where we investigate key areas of the enrollment pipeline to see how well they predict student completion and the five outcomes that we'll be talking about later in, in our presentation. And moving on from this, depending on the results that we, that we get from these models, we hope to do some qualitative focus groups where we dive deeper into what the models were telling us we need to focus on um, and including student equity groups to specifically identify where the areas are for improvement and what we can do about them. 
And then using uh, what we learned from these two phases, what we hope to do is to uh, compose some collaborative action plans where we work again with our cross functional teams to create actionable planning strategies in the key ed areas identified that were needing improvement. And like I said, ultimately to uh, help students when they're in our institution. So this is where we highlight our first lesson learned, which is be flexible with your timeline because we had originally planned for all these three phases to take only one year, we barely got through the first phase. And as you know, I think plans never go the way that you want them to. And with COVID and the pandemic, that threw even a bigger wrench in our plan, but we're still hoping to continue on doing phases two and three. It's just that the way that we are intending the two may have to change a little bit now, especially given that everything is remote. So we're still hoping to do these plans, but like I said, be flexible with your timeline because it, it could change and you never know what's going to happen. So from here, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry so she can give you more details about how we worked with our collaborative group. Great. Thank you, Daisy. Um, here on the screen, you see our OCC SEM team, and we call it uh, our SEM team um, because that's for strategic enrollment management. So our approach was not to build the model disconnected from practice, scholarly research, and our campus. So when the opportunity came to apply for an IEPI strategic enrollment management grab, uh, grant, it allowed us the opportunity to not only discuss the project on our campus and get buy-in, but also a commitment from the college to develop a cross-functional team as an integral resource to support the development of our enrollment pipeline. Um, our project was selected to be part of IEPI's cohort. As such, we identified a set of cross functional practitioners across the campus to work with the research team in building, discussing, and using the model. We intentionally built the team to include faculty, management, classified professionals, and researchers. Also, foreseeing the implications uh, to guided pathways, we ensured that many of our team members were also involved in our guided pathways to implementation team. Another critical support for the project's first year were our IEPI coaches who provided us with both the technical support and ideas for collaboration with our team. So a big shout out to Terrence Willett and Andrew Kretz. Uh, thank you for your support uh, uh, on our first year in, the, in, in our journey. Um, last, uh, we had a STEM lead team and those are the positions that are bolded um, in our slide. And this um, SEM lead team really ensured that we stayed on task uh, and moved through the project um, as, as we had outlined in our, our project plan. So Daisy, we can move to the next slide. So we want to talk a little bit about um, our integral team participation. Um, the first step was we knew we needed to develop common ground for the vision and scope of our project. The first step in bringing our team together was to develop a logic model. Um, during our first IEPI group meeting, the logic model assisted us with identifying the short-term and long-term elements of our project. The logic model walked us through a process of identifying inputs and resources the project needed, the activities to support those inputs, what the outputs or deliverables um, that were expected from those out to activities, and then our short, medium, and long-term outcomes we anticipated. And, you know, our short-term uh, outcomes were one to two year, our medium, I think we put it three to four year outcomes, and then our long-term were four to six year outcomes. So we really tried to assess the, uh, um, the broad impact of this model and this project. The logic model was helpful in developing a plan that set the course for the project, and it's helped the SEM lead team keep the project on track. It's really been critical. Um, it also created a shared understanding of the project. The plan outlined at which points the larger SEM team needed to be brought back in for feedback and consultation. And we also wanted to ensure that the project had an equity focus where equity considerations were intentionally integrated throughout the steps of the project. So in keeping uh, in line with the plan we developed, the next critical step was to engage the team in identifying and operationalizing key components of the pipeline. The first step was to create a literature review, and then the second step was uh, the final model. So if uh, we move next to our literature review. So the literature review was a really important part of our enrollment pipeline. 
Um, we wanted scholarly research to provide insight into the critical factors that have been suggested empirically in student success. Um, key outcome areas um, of the literature review were developed by the STEM team, um, and then they were aligned with the practitioner's areas of expertise. And from that, each practitioner was asked to conduct a literature review. So you can get a sense um, from the slide of our topic area and the kind of broad outcome area um, that, um, uh, that kind of guided the literature review. So uh, each member outlined a minimum of two to three scholarly resources that uh, highlighted the success factors or best practices in that area. And then in addition to the literature review, practitioners were asked to complete a table of activities that occurred in their functional area at OCC as it related to the outcome area to get a sense of what we were doing and maybe what we were not doing. So the next step after literature review was engaging the SEM team in identifying model predictors and targets. So after literature review, and we, we got those all back from our SEM uh, team, we engaged the group again in a multi-hour meeting um, that was aimed at identifying the predictors and the targets that would best help us build the model. We found that not all members had a clear idea about predictive analytics and, the, and we needed to do an overview of the basic premise and key concepts. This really set the stage for um, our small groups uh, to work on specific sections of the pipeline. So at this point, we decided to break the pipeline into three sections, recruitment, retention, and completion. Each group was asked to review the literature reviews in their area and think about the pipeline from their practitioner viewpoint. Um, again, this is where we wanted to bring in their experiences as a practitioner. Um, we had a large pipeline printed and they worked together to identify target variables. We then asked them to identify potential predictors. Then, after those two steps were done, we asked them to review the targets and predictors they identified and to think about if there were equity implications in that area of the pipeline. Our last step with the group was engaging the group and thinking about, do we have these data? If not, how do we get it? If so, how do we define it? And this really set the stage for the researchers to take the lead with operationalizing and building the model. So this is a, an area that you will see uh, lesson learned number two. And this is, uh, it was not originally planned for us to give uh, our group a primer, uh, an extended session on data analytics. Uh, we had done that verbally and talked through it, but we found as we came into this phase, we really needed to work with them on um, data analytics and some of the key terms. And we also needed to build in a lot more time than we had planned to engage our practitioners in this phase of the, report, of the project, excuse me. So this slide just gives you a sense uh, of the practitioner's work in developing the preliminary predictors, targets, and equity implications in the section of the enrollment pipeline they were working on. So you can see the target variables were, um, at, were in green post-its, the predictor, predictor variables were in blue post-its, and then anywhere you see um, um, round stickers, those were where um, the groups felt we had equity implications. Okay, so based on all of this work and engagement uh, with our, our uh, SEM team, um, we identified five se segments of our enrollment pipeline to initially focus on. Um, the first segment looks at students who completed an application and had any registration activity in their first term. The second segment, enrollment at census, is also our first term measure and looks at students who were actively enrolled at census date. The third, third segment is another first term measure, course success, and looks at the success rates of students in their first term. The fourth segment is a first year measure in persistence and looks at students who were enrolled in fall and then were again enrolled in the following spring. And the last segment is completion and that looks at students' long-term outcomes defined as achieving an associate's degree, certificate, or transfer to a four-year institution within two years. So while we originally envisioned one model for our entire pipeline, these later became five separate models focusing 
on each of these as targets. Um, and then the other thing that we want to do is really um, have you keep in mind that we brought the team together throughout this entire process of model development. Um, so after starting to operationalize and build the preliminary model, we brought back the SEM team uh, in for feedback on what the preliminary um, data and models were showing. And we continue to engage the group at all steps of the, of the project. So with that, I am now going to turn this over to Gina Marie to talk about how the researchers operationalized and built the model. All the fun stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. So before we dive into the details of all the predictors and kind of what that looks like, we wanna kind of go over the steps in building a model. So we are talking about using predictive modeling. So before you can do anything, you need to identify your target variables. And that's really, like Sherry said, where our team came together to help come up with potential target variables. The second step is that you need to gather your historical data. So predictive analytics uses historical data to predict your desired outcome. So it's really important that you have a good set of data. Um, the third step is to split your data into different sets. So with a predictive model, you need to have a test or a training data set. So that's how you're teaching your model and then a testing one. So you see how well your model is predicting the outcome. And then if you have a large enough data set, you'll use a validation set. And that is another way for you to see how well and validate what your model is predicting. The fourth step is kind of the fun part where you get to experiment with your prediction models. So if you have a lot of predictors and you want to kind of see if you can remove some to build a stronger model while still maintaining the integrity of it, that's your opportunity to really experiment with it. And then your fifth step, which is going to be very important, is implementing and maintaining your model. Like I said, predictive models are based on historical data. So if something in the past has changed or something right now is changing that's different from the past, you have to be able to maintain those changes for your model to be able to predict another outcome. So with COVID, we'll have to be maintaining our models so that we can have appropriate predictions. So defining the model, like Sherry said, we came up with five different models with five different targets. And at the top of that image on the right hand side of our slide, you'll see the different target variables, registration activity, enrollment at census, course success, persistence, and completion. So within each of these models, we ensured that we had several levels of predictors. So we kept student level predictors similar across all different models, all the different models, so we had that consistency. The last group at the bottom is our equity group, and that's something that moving forward, we're going to be implementing and incorporating intersectionality. So that's an area that we are still going to be working on with our new iterations of these models. The next level of predictors are our co college level ones, which include a lot of scheduling data and class size. We then also incorporated financial predictors, such as financial aid, but within financial aid, we had several predictors. So whether or not a student received FOG, or if they just applied for financial aid, or whether or not they received a certain amount of financial aid. In addition, we incorporated unemployment rates for the various years that we were working with. Lastly, we have our academic predictors, which look at college GPA, course drops, counseling, tutoring, English and math, and you'll see some of these pop up when Daisy goes over the models with you. Now, collecting the data. So like Sherry said, we had a lot of potential predictors from our group, and we had to sit down and look at everything, all those sticky notes, and identify our quantitative data that we had and include in our predictive models. And more of what the predictors are that are qualitative, which we would then collect during our future focus groups. So we had to sit down and organize ourselves and make sure that what we were including was accurate to what the group was suggesting. We then had to look at the changes that we had in our data collection mechanisms and our definitions. So as things change, uh, data changes with it. So for example, um, gender, was updated to include non-binary in 2019. 
and new equity groups were recently added, such as homelessness, first generation, and LGBT. And then recently, in the last couple years, we started collecting high school data, such as GPA, math and English course taking, and their history. So when you're moving forward, you just have to be mindful that your data may change over time. One other thing to remember or to be cognizant of when we go over our models with you is that we have changed the definitions for some of our variables, such as age groups, and that was to better fit our model. So, for example, we categorized our age groups where the model was naturally splitting them. In addition, our residency, we had small sample sizes for our veteran students, our AB 540 and our other, so we lumped them together. But we are taking note of that so that when we look at the results, we can identify who fell into that new category. And then we have our third lesson learned. So sometimes when you are collecting data, you may find that you have a lot of missing data because the way that you collect it has changed or the definitions have changed. So one of the measures we implemented was to create a data dictionary that described where we pulled the data from, so our data source, how the variables were defined, when there were changes, and what those changes were so that we have a strong foundation of understanding and knowing the history of our data so that when we move forward, we can reference back as to perhaps why there was missing data or why there were changes. So exploring predictive models, this is the really fun part. So like I said, in step three, you wanna split your data. If you have a large data set, you wanna split it into three different sets, your training, your tests, and your validation. If you notice that you have a smaller data set and maybe you don't have enough to allocate for all three, you can still build your predictive model with a training set, which is how you teach your model, and then your testing set, which is how you can see um, how accurately your model is predicting the outcomes. So some other considerations is to understand, for us, we decided to use decision trees, and that's based on their intuitive nature and how they're easily explainable to not only technical um, colleagues in the field, but also to your key stakeholders while still maintaining its robustness. So an understanding that we're using decision trees, we have to be aware of the significance level and what um, having several tests does to that significance level. So we use the Bonferroni method to mitigate the overfitting of our model. Um, in addition, you can identify and tell the, the system that you're using how many branches you'd like to grow your tree. For us, we did five. And then you can also have a set of stopping rules. And we varied our rules um, based on the amount of data we had in each of our models. And then finally, when you go to choose a model, it's very important that you run several models and that you like experiment with the models to see which one creates the most um, accurate model and is the best fit. And one of the things to consider when you are tweaking your predictors that you're including is, is it comprehensible and is your model something that's gonna help create action? Um, and one way to identify that you have a good model is to review your predictor importance. Um, when you go over your model accuracy, we'll demonstrate this, but you want to see less than a 5% difference between your train, your test, and your validation data sets. In addition, you want to review your area under the curve, make sure that that's high, your Gini index, make sure that's high, and then you also want to review the lift charts. Things to keep in mind is that no model is perfect, but you want to try the one that is the most accurate and your best fit. You also want to try to avoid biases and self-fulfilling prophecy. And you also have to keep in mind that models must be maintained and replaced over time. Example, with the COVID, things will be changing. Um, lastly, something very important is that as data analysts, we have a responsibility to be aware of the model that we're presenting and ensure that it's not dis discriminating and that the results are not could not lead to harmful consequences. So just a little, don't forget we have a responsibility. So we're gonna go over SPSS Modeler, which is the data science tool that we used in creating our decision trees. It is a drag and drop tool. 
The interface is very intuitive and it has a lot of graphical features. Um, you can read or it can read in many data sources. So if you're working with Excel or R or Python or SPSS, it has the capability of reading those in. In addition to that, it can automatically transform your data. It can create decision trees and neural networks and also perform regression analysis, among many other modeling techniques that we'll show you when we pull that up. And like I said, it can now employ languages such as R and Python. So now Daisy and I are going to give you a little demo of what SPSS Modeler looks like before we go over our actual models. So what we're looking at here is a stream, an SPSS Modeler, and each of these images or icons represent a node or a nugget. So the gold images are our nuggets and the gray kind of icons are our nodes. So in the very first node, we brought in our cleaned and prepared data and we were able to simply import it in. And then the next step was we split up our data into those three sets. So here in the partition node, you can identify the level of percentage you want to split your data and for which data set you want that percentage to be applied. So we did our training, our test and our validation. And then very important is your type node. This is where you're telling SPSS modeler the type of measurement you're using. So flag stands for binary, nominal is similar to categorical, and it reads in your values. So you can ensure that the system is, make, is reading in the values correctly. And the very right column, the role is where you identify what your target is. If you don't want to include it, you can select none or we're like this model, most of them and all of them are our inputs. The next step that we did was run all of our models. So these are chain decision trees with variations are experimenting with the models and they produce an output. So one of the outputs we want to look and review first with you is the lift chart. So the lift chart, there are three images here, and it is showing you the lift chart for the training data set, the testing data set, and the validation. So on the right hand side, there's a legend there to tell you which model you're looking at through the colors. And as you see, the lines differ in their lifts. And so the higher lift is usually the better model. So as you can see, through each of those data sets, you can see the variations in how well the model does with those different sets. So now that you've kind of visually seen how these models are doing, you can look at the analysis output. And like I said, you want your prediction percentage accuracy of correct to be less than a difference of less than 5%. So what we're seeing here is for our training, we have at 83.7%. Then we go to our testing and that's 83.13 and then our validation is 81. So the biggest percent difference we see is about 2%, which means it's a pretty stable model. So that's something that's important that you need to review when you're choosing the best model. And then at the very bottom of this analysis output, you can then compare the area under the curve and the Gini index for each of the models across each of the data sets. So you can see that for most of them, they're 0.8, the Gini index around 0.6, and you can see the difference across each of the data sets. But that is one of the tools in identifying your best fit model. And now that we've talked about models, Daisy's gonna actually share with you some of ours. Thank you, Gina Marie. So now that we've seen how to do this, we are interested in what, what did we get? Um, so like Sherry said, we intentionally initially what, thought we were going to have one huge model, but instead we had five. So each of these models, just to kind of remind you, the first one is looking at registration activity. So whether this wants a student apply, do they actually even attempt to register for any class at OCC? And then we looked at, for those that it did actually attempt to register, did they stay enrolled at census? 
Then we said we looked at whether or not these students passed these classes that they enrolled in, and then looking beyond where they see they if they came back in the next spring semester, and then finally looking into the future, did they eventually uh, complete do complete their educational goal, which we counted as getting a certificate, an associate's degree, or transferring for to a four-year institution. Now, one thing to keep in mind that for this first iteration uh, of our models, we only looked at first time students. So just the students, they've never been a college student before. It's their first time here at OCC. And they applied between, for the fall semesters between 2015 and 2019. So just keep in mind that that's gonna be true for all of these five models. So taking a look at our first model, which is uh, registration activity. So does a student attempt to register? For this model, we had about 41,418 students in, in this whole set. Um, of overall, just looking at descriptives here, 49% of them actually attempted to register for a class at OCC. And in this model, we incorporated 14 different predictors. Um, if you remember from the first one, you'll see that most of them are going to be student level predictors. So how uh, you describe the students, um, as well as unemployment rate in this instance. So when we looked at what were our top predictors in this model, we came up with seven. So there's residency, so what the residency status was um, in an added district, uh, whether or not they had a high school diploma, their age group, whether or not they came into a high school feeder, their ethnicity, and their first generation status. So you'll see these predictors pop up in the tree that we'll show you next. Now, um, since we have a lot of models, um, we don't have time to go over them in everything fine detail. So just to kind of give you an idea of what you look at or what the output is when you're using SPSS modeler, I'm gonna go into more detail uh, with this model, um, but just keep in mind that I'm not going to do this this much. So you'll get something that looks like this, pop out of SVSS modeler. And so your top one here, you'll see that this is your um, target. So for our registration here, um, it's uh, at 48% for, for, this, for this model. And I apologize that it's so small. Um, but you'll see here um, the first kind of branch that it pops out on the very top is here is residency status. And you'll see that it kind of um, expands to four different uh, leaves here. So you'll have your California resident on this side, your foreign students here, your out-of-state students here, and your other students here. So like Gina Marie said, these are the ones, the smaller groups that we clump together. So what this first branch is telling you is this: these four different groups of students are uh, displaying the uh, registering at different kind of rates. So you'll see over here in this uh, note over here to the very right, our other students, um, their rate of registration activity is almost at 79%. So that is significantly higher than our overall rate of 49, meaning that for these groups of students, they're coming here and they know that they want to come here. So it's maybe something specific about their residency status that there's causing them to behave that way. Next over here, um, I'll show you that their foreign students are registering a very low rate. So here it is at 4.6%. And then this, this leaf does not branch off anymore. So for this foreign student here and the other group here, that's where their tree ends. There's nothing else predicting that was significant for the registration activity for those groups. Now for the out-of-state students, which is this, this one right here, they are uh, registering at about a 22% rate. And then their branch, their tree kind of branches off to uh, a little bit more. There's what's making a difference for them is whether they're not are in and out of district. So when they are in district, they are registering at about a 48%. When they're out of district, they're only registering at about a 15 and a half percent rate. So they're, when they're out of district and out of state, they're not actually attempting to register at, at an institution. Now, what matters for those students that are out of state and they are not in our district, um, is the unemployment rate. And here we had the model split it out, whether it was less than 4% or higher than 4%. So when it is higher than 4%, um, there, 
registration activity rate is higher at 21.8%. So we already know this from previous data. This is not something that's unusual. When the unemployment rate is higher, we tend to have more people come to our institutions. Now, when the unemployment rate is a little lower, so less than 4%, what is mattering then is the ethnicity or race of the student, where the white students are uh, registering at 21.7%. Um, the Hispanic, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and those that we do not know their race are only registering at 7.5%. And the American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian, Black, and multiracial students are registering at about 12.8%. So here we see a possible area that there may be some disproportionate impact where the different ethnic and racial groups of students are attempting to register at different rates. So it would be uh, probably uh, a good area for us to focus deeper into, maybe with focus groups, with calling, with some kind of surveys to kind of see why is it that they are not come, trying to even register. So they're applying and not even attempting to register for class. So this is an area that could we dive deeper. Now, moving over over here to the left side, looking at our California residents, they're registering at about 52% rate. And then again, we see the in and out of district um, a predictor here popping up at a top level with those with that are in a district are registering at a higher rate and those that are not in district at a lower rate. So it's a 61% compared to 44%. And then each of these kind of branch off into even more um, nodes here. So for in district, age category is making a difference where the younger students are attempting to register at higher rates than the older students. So the cutoff here is 20 or less and then 21 or older are doing less. And then it splits off again into whether or not they're Hispanic or not Hispanic. And for those that are not Hispanic, um, the first gen set, uh, generation status comes into play where those that are not are, are first gen are registering at slightly lower rates than those that are not. And then coming over here to look at our added district, the high school diploma is what's making a difference here. Um, with those that do have one high school feeder again comes into play. And then these again kind of break off into whether or not they're Hispanic with the students that are um, Hispanic uh, attempting to register at lower rates than the students that are not. Um, so this kind of gives you kind of a good idea like what is the progression of when you look at students who try to apply and even attempt to register, you'll see that not every student is following the same path and different things are affecting whether or not they attempt to register at a college. Um, so moving on to um, our next model, which is model number two, uh, whether or not they stay enrolled. So what we see here is um, we have about 20,000 students here. So we only took the ones that actually attempted to register and used them for this, for this model. Um, and we see that we have a high rate of them actually staying at census. So 87% of them are staying at census. Um, so this might be a model that, you know, is probably not high priority because we're always already seeing a high rate, but it's still good to take a look at it. So so we had 14 predictors in this model as well, and they're the same ones as in model one, but we only see four predictors here popping up as the top ones. So we see age, ethnicity, high school feeder, and Hispanic indicator popping up for this model. When we take a look at these, the specifics of this model, and this one is a little smaller, so it's a little bit easier to comprehend. And you'll see in this first branch off, the first thing, this, the, the very top branch here is age. Uh, and again, we see kind of similar patterns as before, where the older students here are um, staying at census at a 69.6% rate compared to those who are younger than 18, it's a 91.6. Um, and then for those that are 18 to 20, it's around 87 and a half. So even though we had a high overall rate of students staying on, at census, you're still seeing differences and I think big differences depending on the age of the group. And then for these older students, the branch stops there. So it doesn't continue to grow. Um, but for the students that are between 18 and 20, we'll see that high school feeder pops up again, as well as whether or not they're Hispanic. And those that are less than 18, um, their ethnicity uh, race comes into play. And then just keep in mind that this is their age at application. So this is probably why we're seeing such a large number of students that are less than 18 is they're probably applying while they're still in high school. 
Um, and just I wanted to point out that that 21 and older one was significantly lower than the other two groups. And then the other categories that pop up in this model. Now, when we are uh, look at whether or not the students are actually succeeding in their courses, um, we see that the rate is a little bit lower. So it's 66% rate, a success rate, not too bad. I think it's, it's around what we're used to seeing. And just keep in mind, again, these are first time students only. Um, we had roughly 61,980 enrollments to look, that we looked at in this model with a total of 17 predictors. Now our top predictors, you'll see there are many more that pop up in this model. And you'll see some that are beyond the, the student level model. So not just what, how you describe student, but also now you move into kind of more academic and institutional uh, factors coming in. So you'll see that counseling here, whether or not they saw a counselor is going to pop up in this model. You'll see that class size will pop up in this model. Um, the amount of financial aid, the instructional method, so whether it was like a lab, online, et cetera, pops up in this model. Um, whether or not they went to tutoring in that first semester comes up. Um, and again, we'll see the unemployment rate and whether or not they're in that district. And one thing you'll see pop up here is latency, which we took from the, the literature, which is a de defined as how recently did they in graduate from high school. So for our model, we looked at whether or not they just came out of high school or not. So it's a binary yes or no. For yes, they just came out of college, I mean, out of high school. So looking at the model, it's a little bit more complex than our previous two models. So I'm not going to go over each branch in this model because that would take a long time. But I just wanted to highlight some things that we thought were very interesting. So you'll see here in our top branch here, ethnicity and race again comes out as one of the high, one of the top predictors. Um, and we're going to kind of focus in on each of these. So you'll see here, this is our Black and African American students. And you'll notice here that they're their tree kind of stops after one additional predictor. So there's nothing grows beyond this. And that one, the predictor is latency. So overall, our Black and African American students are succeeding in their courses at a 51% rate. Uh, but then that is very different depending on whether or not they just recently graduated from high school. So for the recent high school graduates, that rate, it goes up to 60%. And for our students, Black and African American students who did not come straight from high school, that's only a 35% rate. Right? So this would be another good area to kind of dive deeper into, uh, especially with focus groups. Is it something different that these students need to succeed in the courses, whether it be the resources that they are required, whether it be the time or scheduling that they may need to take the classes in, because whatever may have kept them from it, you know, coming into college directly after high school may also be affecting them in, in whether or not they succeed. So this would be, I think, a very interesting area to dive further into um, for these groups of students. Now, looking at the other um, uh, ethnic and racial groups, um, you'll see here to the left, we have our Native American, Alaska Native, and Hispanic students. The model put them into one group, and they had about a 58% success rate in their classes. And then we had our Asian students here at a 76% rate, our multiracial Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, the model put them into a group with a 65% success rate, and our white students here are at a 71% success rate. So this is not uncommon to what we're used to seeing in our data when we disaggregate by these groups. The trends are similar. Now, a couple of uh, other things that I want to point out in this model is that the next level down for most of these students is counseling. So whether or not they went to go see a counselor in, in this, then their first term affected their success or affected their success rates. And in all of these instances, when they did, the success rates were higher. Another thing that I wanted to point out is that class size came into uh, uh, into play for two of these groups. So just the the uh, Native American and Asian groups here, class size came into effect. And for our Asian, Asian students here, the class size came into effect. And this is a predictor that I kind of added last minute because I saw that people talking about it on the listserv. So I thought like what a perfect opportunity to just throw that in to see if that's causing an effect. And what's interesting about this one is that what I was expecting to happen here didn't actually show in our data. So I'm just going to highlight what happened with our Native American and Alaskan and Hispanic 
Hispanic students um, is that the smaller slide size, so less than 33, had a 68% success rate. And then our larger class size here, greater than 167, had actually the highest success rate for this group of students. Um, and then when looking at the middle, you kind of see like a U pattern uh, trend with the data where it starts dipping a little bit as the classes get a bigger and then in this middle one is where we hit our lowest success rate for the students at 53% and then it starts going back up as, as the class sizes get bigger. Um, so that's thing is very interesting and we're not sure why this is happening. Um, it could be you know the type of classes that are getting scheduled and these sizes could be very different. Um, it could be that the expectation of the students is different knowing that they're going into a big class they say hey I know I'm not going to have a lot of engagement with my professor, I'm going to have to do this on their own, and they may be more motivated to, to, uh, to succeed in their courses, so they take those large classes, whereas with the lower ones, they're getting that more engagement with their faculty, and that's probably helping. So this is just kind of like hypotheses here that I'm throwing out, but I thought that that was very interesting that we're seeing that kind of U-shaped trend for those data. And then with our Asian students here, I didn't highlight it, but we saw a, different, a, a similar tr pattern here where we're getting that U-shaped kind of uh, pattern with their data with success rates. Now, moving on to whether or not they come back in the spring. Um, we had 17,000 students for this data set, and we had a very high um, uh, rate of persistence for these first-time students. So 80% of them that were here in the fall came back the next spring. Um, for this model, we had 23 predictors. And again, we're seeing uh, more predictors popping up here. We're seeing now GPA coming up. We're seeing whether or not they took English and math in their first semester popping up, uh, whether they or not they changed their major in that first semester is making a difference, as well as some other uh, student level data. Now for this one, again, a com more complex model. Um, the top tier branch here being GPA, and you'll see here that the data kind of goes in the direction that you expect it to, where lower GPA, lower persistence, higher GPA, higher persistence. When they are not passing their classes, they're only 40% of them are coming back. When they have, we're passing most of their classes, they're coming back here at a 95% rate. But one thing that I wanted to point out also, those that have a very high GPA had a slightly lower uh, uh, persistence rate, so only at 88%. So there's something about these high achieving students that might be a little bit different than the other ones. Uh, one more thing I wanted to point out in this model was whether or not they took English and math in their first semester. Um, and this pops up for this kind of middle uh, GPA range here. When they are taking it, um, both of these classes, they are persisting at higher rates. So this is just, um, you know, try, try, keep in mind, you know, do, if this is something that's important, we want to make sure we have the scheduling available for students to take both of these classes and, you know, making sure um, counseling is encouraging students to do this. And large, you know, largely this data was before our, our college really implemented AB 705. Um, so it would be interesting to see now that we have fully implemented it, how this is going to change and if we see even higher rates with this happening. Now, uh, for our next one uh, was completion. We only took or wanted to see if they completed in two years because this is a two-year institution. So 24% of our students actually completed within these two teams and we had 18 predictors. And again, we see a large number of predictors popping up on top. Um, we have counseling again popping up here sorry, uh, whether or not they completed a comprehensive plan in their first year. Uh, and again, we're seeing the English and math pop up again. So for this one, um, I didn't want to highlight too much. Again, the top branch here is counseling visits. So we counted how many semesters they went to go see a, a counselor. Uh, and you see the trend when they're not coming to see the counselor at all, their um, rate of completion is only at 12%. When they see the counselor basically almost every semester, they're completing in a two year time frame at 41%. And then we get that odd one rent when they're seeing more than four times, you know, that's it's a little bit lower than what we see for four. So this would be another one interesting to see is like when they have a counselor and they're going to see it, they, you know, they may be uh, better able to know what to take and how to complete. So they're completing at those higher rates. Um, so that's a broad overview of what we found um, for our five models. So now that we have all this information, you know, what are we going to do with it? And um, as much as me and Jen and Marie like geeking out over this, we know we have to make sure that this leads to some actionable data. So I'm going to turn it back over to Sherry again to talk about our next steps. 
Thank you, uh, Daisy and Gina Marie. So um, now that we've completed uh, our five models, uh, we do have plans to re-engage our um, SEM lead team, or excuse me, our SEM team into um, the project. Um, so our SEM team, they reviewed the preliminary models um, and provided insights. Now we're gonna re-engage them again now that the models are final. Um, our intent is to get their insights um, as it relates to recommendations for action uh, and also where we may need to go next. Um, and there are also a number of other stakeholders that we will engage on our campus, such as our guided pathways teams and the student success and, and enrollment committee, just to name a few. Additionally, um, as we uh, worked through this project, we realized that it aligned with a key activity in our Title V STEM grant. So we do have plans now to integrate our STEM majors into the model. And last, we will be aligning this to our college's plans and metrics, um, such as our educational master plan, student equity plan, quality focus XA, vision for success goals, guided pathways. We really saw how this enrollment pipeline aligned with all of those efforts and the metrics. Now we come to another lessons learned. And uh, one of the things that we learned is that we really needed to bring our SEM team in uh, more frequently so that they really understood the whole process and also to keep them familiar and engaged with the process. Because once you get into the model building, that can take a while. And so making sure that we have those touch points to bring them in um, is a, a lesson learned and something that we are working on doing better. Dana Marie? So we have further research to do, and that includes having our focus groups for our qualitative um, variables. And that includes, of course, the student voice. We're also gonna explore different ways to incorporate equity groups, such as that intersectionality piece. And then, of course, we need to maintain, and as we progress, redefine models uh, based on what's happening. And then, of course, like Sherry mentioned, we're gonna have iterations of this models with subsets groups of students such as our STEM students. And our lesson number five is we realized now that we've completed our first iteration, we didn't have a student on our STEM team. And we don't want to lose that student voice. So moving forward, we plan on incorporating our students into this project. Thank you. So that's it for us. We will open it up to questions now. Um, and I'm seeing some in the chat right now. So um, somebody asked about desegregating the Asian group of students. So that is definitely something that we're going to be want to looking at is how um, not just, uh, you know, disaggregating the, the individual race and ethnic groups, but looking also at intersectionality. So I know that now we look at gender um, and all the other equity groups for our equity plan. So looking at that and seeing how we can incorporate that into our model. So we kind of have a more robust and more comprehensive look at our students. And I saw a question uh, regarding random forest models. Actually, yes, we did uh, uh, tinker with that and try and use random forest modeling. And what we found was that they were very similar to our CHADE decision trees. So we figured we would just keep it consistent in using CHADE. Um, but yes, we did. Uh, what you see is our final product, but we have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours and created thousands of models, and these were the ones that were the best. Yeah, like I said, this, this, the first part <laughs> of our model took us a year, so we, we could, you know, do it, numerous iterations, different type of analyses, um, you know, regressions, things like that. Um, so we kind of want to keep it, because we wanted also to learn uh, about more about this particular model and specifically decision trees. Um, so that we, that was kind of our goal for this. So we, of course, um, Gina and Emery and I will go you know, geek out and look at all these other stuff, so. Um, is there any other questions, Brad, that we may have missed on here? I know we only have about five minutes. Yeah, I'm scrolling through the chat right now, trying to find them. There was a question about sharing the slide deck. Uh, is that something the team is planning to do? Or we're also gonna host this webinar, obviously, on the RP website. So just wondering what your preference was there. Yeah, we can send you a, a cleaned up version of our PowerPoint. You don't want, I don't think you guys want all the ones with the circles and the squares and all that, but we can send you those out as well. And I did also remember um, someone asking about resources about learning about this. So maybe we can include a slide at the end with some links to some resources that we use when we uh, were doing this project. 
And Thanks. Daisy, uh, maybe mm -hmm. I know we had a question about our literature review, so perhaps we could um, include a summary uh, of the literature review in, uh, in the slide deck we send out. Yes, we'll do that. And then I do see another question. Uh, does having Hispanic and IPIDS ethnicity as two distinct variables reduce the predictive capabilities of both variables? So that, that is a great question. We did run correlation matrices to see if some of our variables were correlating with each other. Um, and we did take note of the ones that did, and that's where we experimented with our models and removing them and, and adjusting which ones were actually being used. Um, and in doing so, what you saw Daisy present was the one that had the best model. Um, we also did some dimensionality reduction to try to look at the, the, the factor analysis and the components and seeing which ones had the largest influence on the model. So we did do a lot of behind the scene work that we didn't cover um, due to time constraints. But uh, based on our results, we didn't notice that there was a, a reduction in the predictive capabilities of both variables. Then we have another question about looking at class size. Um, and they're asking, did you check the modality two? And yes, we included modality in our decision tree as well as instructional method. Um, so we did. Uh, and then what you saw was as what, what came out on top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we send out the slides, hopefully you'll be able to zoom in on some of those decision trees. So you'll be able to see the different branches to see what came up on top and how they affected the, each of the targets. And I'm trying to get through all these questions. I see another one. Is the completion metric of interest based on ed goal or just whether or not they ticked any of those boxes? For this one, we just looked at whether they ticked any one of those boxes. So we didn't kind of align if they had said an ed goal um, and that's what they completed. We just said what, if they completed any and one of those for one of that. And that's mostly because I think previously um, students just kind of pick and they may not change their ed goal throughout. So we kind of said like it, the behavior is well, there was intent. So if they got an AS degree or certificate or transferred, we counted it all as a completion. And we used um, the national student clearinghouse to match up for those four years transfers. And I'm going to just try to keep going through these. Uh, did you look at other FWER corrections like Tukey? Um, no, I don't think that we did that. But what we did was we adjusted our Chade decision tree based on significance level, based on pruning. Um, and so that's what we were using. We know, or we know that with decision trees, there can be false um, negatives, um, but we were hoping, and what we did was to mitigate that was changing those significance levels um, and then trying to incorporate the predictors that weren't naturally correlated. But usually the CHADE decision tree does those tests of significance across. Um, yes. yes, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. And I know we're only down to a minute. Um, so if you guys have any questions, you know, please feel free to contact us uh, for any specifics, Gina Marie or, or Sherry or, da or me, Daisy. Um, you can email any one of us and we're happy to share our experience and our knowledge that we've learned from this project. And there's one last question I'm gonna attempt to answer really quick. Did we use other algorithms like neural network? Yes, we did. They're much more complicated to explain because they're kind of like a black box. But if you have more questions, we can address that um, outside of this. Thanks, team. Excellent presentation today. Thank you very much for sharing it with everyone. Um, I've linked a copy of the uh, survey in the, in the chat. Please visit that and be sure to let our uh, presenters know how they did today. Um, we're always interested in, in learning more about how we can serve your needs. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week and look forward to connecting with you on the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.